Well, I am delighted to see you today. Bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if you happen to miss Tallahassee, it was one incredible meeting. Yeah, it was very good. And uh, you can go to my YouTube website, which is Apostle Ken. That's, the, that's how you find it. And uh, you can go in there and see the four or five meetings that we had. And uh, you can watch those. And so I would encourage you to go and do that because they were very powerful. God really spoke into the state of Florida in an awesome, awesome way. And I was uh, the benefactor and blessed to receive two keys in this meeting. This key here was brought to me by, from two intercessors from Jerusalem. And this one here was given to me by Chuck Pierce from Nineveh. And so I really felt like that the Lord was giving me the key that will unlock transformation just like he did in Nineveh. And giving me the key like he did with Peter to unlock the prison doors when he was in prison in Jerusalem there. And I want to share with you the word that Chuck gave to me concerning the key. And when I, when I read this word and when I talk to you about the keys, there's no power or authority in these keys at all. It's a prophetic act of what God is doing in me, or if it was you, it would be in you. And so these keys only represent something. There's no power in these keys. But I want to read you this word here. This key is an ancient key, and you're going to need it to fully unlock Florida. Florida is a first state, so to speak. The first city in America is in Florida. It's got a first anointing on it. That's why this Pentecost is so important here. Pentecost is the feast of first fruits. When Dutch and I first came, he said Florida is a first fruit state. This key is a ward lock key, W-A-R-D, not war. A ward lock key has built within it a combination, and it's got different lock structures in it. The only way that it will unlock is with a key that is called a ward lock key because it does, when, what it does when it goes in, it causes the combinations to realign. And then all of a sudden, the door comes open. This is a key first formed in Nineveh, and this key is ancient and unlocking our future. And the Lord will say to you, I'm restoring the call to those across Florida who have left the call. I'm calling them back into place with three generations to come into alignment with them. I say to you, you will begin to call them back into place with three generations to come into alignment with them. I say to you, you will begin to call forth the army of three generations. And the Lord says, I'm going to give you a key to cause that combination to begin to realign. And I say where the door has been closed or only partially open, now there will be an opening of this door across Florida. And this will be the beginning of restoring my original intent and my call back to this state for this nation in Jesus' name. Powerful word. Powerful work. And I did some studying on this ward lock key. And it just like Chuck says, when you insert it, and it's funny how it inserts. When you insert that and you turn it, it flips a tumbler. And that tumbler flips another tumbler. And that tumbler flips another tumbler. It brings everything into alignment. A regular key won't unlock a ward lock key. So it's very unusual. And uh, <clears throat> last night I had the pleasure and th this morning of speaking at the camp meeting that um, Clyde Oliver, Pastor Clyde Oliver, puts on every year. Tremendous liberty there both last night and this morning. I was so blessed. Uh, tomorrow morning I leave at 5, I leave the house at 5 a.m., or actually 4.30 a.m., board an airplane and fly to uh, Dulles Airport. I'm going to uh, help Patty Whitaker do her son's memorial service. And so I'll be going up there. See, y'all pray for me. It's been a very busy week, you know, and I haven't had a chance to catch my breath, but the Lord has been good. Amen. Amen. I want to talk to you tonight about change. <clears throat> and Oh, by the way, before I go any beyond here, let me just say thank you, Ian and Janine and Tammy, for coming to see us. 
It's so awesome to have you here. Now, some of you that are new do not even know them, but they're just some awesome people. They, they used to be a part here, and they still are, uh, but they decided to take a little ship voyage. They have a sailboat, and so they sailed down to Honduras, was it, with the intent of going to Australia, I think, and, uh, but Tammy just got a scholarship to Wheaton College in Chicago. If you know anything about Wheaton, that's a beautiful, beautiful college. She's going to learn a lot there. And uh, I'm excited for you, Tammy. That's going to be an awesome. And you just need to keep us updated as to what goes on there. So we're going to talk about change tonight. Say change. Say, I don't like change. I know you don't. Nobody really likes change. And when we talk about change, we talk about it and saying that maybe somebody else needs to change and not us. That's how we think. We think that everybody should change except for me. I'm okay. And when I won't change or when I'm expecting change, what I'm actually wanting from the Lord is just a better souped up version of who I am. We really don't want change because change requires you to do what? Change. Requires a change. Now, Dutch recently over the last six months or so, he's had people come and give him bags of change. He had one little girl that brought a a bag of change up to him. They took up the offering and she had it in a little uh, saran wrap or something and brought change up here. And all of a sudden he's starting to get change different places that he goes to speak and so he asked Chuck he said Chuck what is all this change that they're giving me what does it mean and Chuck said change is coming (laughs) and whether you want it to or not change always comes I never will forget when I started announcing back in 2015 and 16 that I felt Trump was going to be president Everybody resisted that change because he was so out of the box. Nobody's like him. Nobody. We've never had a president like this guy here. But I feel like that the Lord has anointed him to be the way that he is because you would not bring change to America being the way the former presidents were. It takes somebody with that kind of tenacity. And you know, it it seems like he loves being in the fight. None of us are like that, but I never will forget right here in Melbourne, somebody asked me in a little house meeting that we were in, I forget whose house we were in, and uh, they said, who do you think is going to be the president? I said, Trump. You, you should have heard the moans and groans and the squeals when that started taking place. But the Lord wanted to bring real change, and to bring real change, you have to have something that pushes you out of your comfort zone. Because you can never change inside your comfort zone. And so there's a pushing. When change takes place, there's a pushing out of the comfort zone. First of all, you may get a word from the Lord. The Lord tells you, I'm going to do this in you. I'm going to do this through you. But you're thinking that he's going to do it just the way that you are. And he never does that. You get, you get a word, and then all of a sudden, when you get the word, you receive hope. Then hope then requires commitment. Say commitment. Look at somebody and say, he's talking to a generation now. It requires commitment. After commitment, change will involve pain. P-A-I-N. Say that again. Capital P. Change will involve pain. We don't like pain. But to move to this new place, it will require pain in your life. Because you don't want to shift out of that old position. And moving out of that old position is going to be painful getting out of that position to get into the new. When pain comes along, you then have the opportunity to go back to the way you were. Or you can renew your commitment and say, I'm going into this change. Because this is what the Lord has said I must do. And if you renew your commitment, then you're going to have renewed hope. 
But then you're going to have more pain. Because he's not done with you yet. Look at somebody and say, pain happens. We did that song about the pressing and the crushing a moment ago. And that's just what that song is about. Without that pressing, without that crushing, without you being challenged, there will never be change in your life. You have to be challenged. So listen to this. Change requires, it means, talks about transitions, what change is about. When you came into this world, you came into this world in pain. And the only one we really heard from was your mama until you were born. Then we heard from you. I never will forget when Cheryl was pregnant with our first daughter. And she's, we're in the hospital there. She's in labor. And she's just moaning and crying out loud. And she says, Mama. I said, baby, I'm right here. I don't want you. I want Mama. <laughs> Pain was involved. I won't tell you everything she said, but she looked up at me and she said, never again. <laughs> because there was pain involved. You ladies know what I'm talking about. And so they roll her into the delivery room and she delivers our oldest daughter. She comes out smiling from ear to ear, chewing gum and saying, we have a girl, we have a girl, we have a girl. All that pain that she was experiencing now, she wasn't experiencing it. Everything had shifted. And she brought forth the fruit of her womb, the child that she and I conceived together, the pain that she went through, turned into fruit and into blessing. Amen. Well, at that point, neither she or Amanda had a choice. Let me say that again. At that point, neither she or Amanda had a choice. That baby was on its way out into this world there was no choice that Cheryl had there was no choice that Amanda had then when our second one came along her name's Jennifer Cheryl delivered that child so easy we had gone down always remember this when it's time to give birth go eat catfish <laughs> we had gone down and had a catfish dinner at a place called Ezel's fish camp and Cheryl's pregnant she's ready to give birth anytime now and we're on our way back and Amanda who is now three she praised me. She said, Lord, let mama deliver this baby tonight. Now, we didn't know what the baby was because there was no sonogram back in that day. You didn't find out until the baby was born. And so we walk into, we had a mobile home. We walk into the doorway of our mobile home and her water breaks. And she was in pain and, and pre labor and pre-labor with Amanda for like seven days. But with Jennifer, only one hour. So we rush to the hospital, we get to the hospital there, and she's not in pain like she used to be in pain, like she was in pain with Amanda. For some reason, the pain was less. And there's a time in your life when you start learning how to transition and learning how to move with change that the pain becomes less, even though the pain is there, it's not as strong as it was when you first begin changing. So they roll her in the delivery room. And then our family doctor, he says to her, well, we want to bring either your mom or your husband in here. Now, who do you think she said? <laughs> well, she didn't. See, transition had taken place. She said, I want my husband here. And so the nurse opens the door and says, you, or the doctor, actually, he comes out and he says, Dr. Ketchum, he said, you want to see this baby? I said, yeah. So I thought, she, I thought the baby had already been born. Still didn't know what it was. And so I walk in, and the baby's not here yet. Cheryl's sitting there, and I'm up at the head, you know, and holding her. And all of a sudden, I had to dr put all the gowns and garments on. And all of a sudden, Jennifer is born. And uh, the neat thing was about this that I was the first person in the Demopolis Hospital to go into the delivery room with their wife. All because she had learned how to transition, and instead of asking for mama, she asked for her husband to come in there. That's a good word there. I don't care where you come from. So 
See, when we go through change, most people will walk away from change. Most people will shy away from it. Any kind of change, whether it's a change in the structure of the church, change in your personal life, most people will walk away from change because it's too painful. Because it, the, the, the old, Jesus said it like this, the old wine seems to taste better than the new wine. But what he's pouring out today is new wine and not old wine. But if you want the old wine, he'll let you have that. But if you want to be in present day revelation, he'll give you new wine, which requires a new wine skin of you, which means you're going to be, you're going to be made pliable. You're going to be made in a place where you can be molded and shaped and put into the fashion that the Lord wants you to be in. And when that change is happening, issues start manifesting. Issues in our life manifest when change begins to happen. When Cheryl and I first got married, we did not know how to be husband and wife. She brought to the table what her parents taught her, and I brought to the table what my parents taught me. We knew nothing about marriage, and so we entered into that marriage just like that. The first two years were pretty, yeah, rough, like hell. She's demanding her way, I'm demanding my way. I know none of you ever know anything about that. You've got both of these demands going on because this is what we brought to the table. But at the same time, change is taking place. We're learning how, what Psalms 133 says, we're learning how to dwell together so that the result becomes unity. We're still not there yet in those first two years, but we're learning. Everything is changing. The way I think changes, the way she thinks changing, everything is changing. Uh, <clears throat> I love to have cooked breakfasts. I love cooked breakfast. I love grits, eggs, sausage, bacon, biscuits, gravy. You know, you can throw some quail in there and dove. And, and when we first, after we first got married, see, I, now I'm going to tell you that my mom spoiled me, didn't she, Cheryl? I had meal every time and the kind of meal I'm talking about yeah your mom spoiled your dad spoiled you <laughs> so we get married and I've got to go to work one morning it's like you know I don't know 5 30 a.m. and I walk downstairs and she has thrown some toast in the toaster and I've taken it out and putting jelly on it I hate toast and jam. That is not my kind of breakfast. And because I'm in transition, I let her know this is not my kind of breakfast. I say, you're going to have to get up earlier. Fix me breakfast. And she says, if you don't like this, fix it yourself. Change is happening. Change is happening. Say, change is happening. Change, transition and change is never pretty. I watched them as they had the streets tore up here on A1A for a while. And how it was all torn up and they're putting in the curves, new curves and new medians and stuff like this. But now that change has taken place. It looks beautiful. It functions well. They, they're working on the road over Pineda. After you go over the causeway before you get to Wickham there, it looks like they're going to build a bridge across the railroad track or something like that. I don't really know. But they're redoing all of that. And it is bumpy. It is rough. It is, it's a challenge to get through there, especially with traffic. You're, you're doing like this, like a snake, because of the way they got the, have the road built. However, in about two years, that change is going to pay off or more. Somebody say or more. And all of a sudden, you're going to ride over there on a smooth road, and you're going to say, oh, this is so nice. This is better than it was before because you endured the change. Now, look with me in Genesis chapter 11, if you would, because I want to show you some things about change. Now, if you leave from here and you say, Lord, change me, get ready. Get ready. In verse 31, this is Abraham's, Abraham's dad. 
It says, And Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. It's a very important thing here that you, you'll see here, is that Terah came up short of his destination. I'm not sure why he came up short, but I can imagine a part of it was the fact it required so much change. From Ur all the way into Canaan land was 1,000 miles, and he made it halfway. He did not get into his destiny. I believe that God called him to go there, although it doesn't say that. But he didn't get into his destiny, and he fell short of it probably because he didn't like change. And so he fell short. He settled there. He settled for second best instead of the land that flows with milk and honey. He settled for what uh, uh, Haran had in that land there. But then God raises up somebody else. Say, he raises up somebody else. He raises somebody else up. His name is his son. His name is Abram. If you look in chapter 12, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, for you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord has spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. I love this. I love this story here. Because Abram went all the way in, but Abram's life was a mess. It was a real mess. He gets into his journey. He gives his wife away, telling the king two different times, this is his sister, the Lord reveals this to the king, gives her back to him, and says, get out of my country. However, God had a way of redemption to redeem every mess that Abraham and Sarah got involved in. Another time, they're wanting to make change happen because God has promised them a son, but Sarah can't conceive. And so Sarah and Abraham, they're going to help God out. We're going to help God out with this change. We're going to speed this change up. This change is not happening in the way that I want it to happen. God has promised them a son of promise. But they want a son after the flesh. And so she says, take Hagar, my handmaiden. Go and lay with her. She gives birth to a nightmare. To an Ishmael who to this day still causes problems for Israel. To this day. Abraham did that. However, God was not done with Abraham because he said, you, this is not the heir. He told him, he said, this is not the heir. The heir is going to be one that comes from your loins, from Sarah's womb. That will be the heir. And so now they've had to wait on the promise. They've endured all this pain and many years wandering around in Canaan land. And then all of a sudden, the son, they conceive and the son of promise is brought forth. See, there, when you start moving toward change, there's always pain involved. Sometimes there's mistakes involved. But there's always pain involved. You and I need to stay true to the word of the Lord. And in Genesis 14, 13, if you turn just one page over, you'll see why Abraham was able to accomplish God's will. In verse 13, it says, Then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew, now, he was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite. I want to I share the first part of that sentence with, or the first sentence. A fugitive came and told Abraham the Hebrew. That's the first place in the Bible we see the word Hebrew ever used. Has a very interesting definition to that word. You may think that it's just a nation. But that word in the Hebrew is abar, H-A-B-A-A-B-A-R, abar. And it actually means one who crosses over. 
or one who has the ability to cross over. See, when change is taking place in your life, you have to be one who has the ability, the tenacity, the, the, the spiritual uh, uh, fortitude to take the change all the way. Because if you take it all the way, you're going to reap and a tremendous harvest and gain at the other side of change. So like I've said before, that there is a glory that's to be had on the other side of inconvenience. Many believers today only want to serve God when it's convenient for them to serve Him. However, there's an inconvenient side, and disciples know that, that if they will inconvenience themselves enough, they will step over into a glory they've never seen over here in this other place. Hallelujah. You and I need to become people who possess the transition. Now, in 1994, some of you have heard this story. It was January of 94, and I had preached a message in our, to our congregation to follow the dream that God has placed in your heart. Up by Crystal River, where they filmed the movie Elvis Presley did called Follow That Dream. There is a Follow That Dream Parkway. I have a picture of it at my house. And it says, Follow That Dream of a road sign. And so I preached that message on following the dream that God has put in your heart. And the following week, I am outside my house and I'm doing some yard work and an airplane is flying over. And the Lord says to me, he says, you don't practice what you preach. I said, no, wait a minute, God. I do. You ever argue with God? I do quite often. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you've always wanted to fly an airplane, but you've never taken a first lesson. And I said to him, I said, Lord, do you know how much it costs to fly? Those were my words to him like he didn't know. I said, besides that, Lord, I have four kids. And he said this to me, and it's changed my life completely the way I look at money. He said, if money is an issue to you, you will never accomplish what I've called you to do. I went out that, for, that week and I took my first lesson in flying an airplane. By the end of that year, I had my pilot's license. But you know, one of the most challenging things of that flying, learning how to fly, was me learning how to get the weather right. Because you may think it's just, the, if the skies are good, you just get out there and hop in the airplane and you go, and that's not the way it is. Especially if it's 95 in Florida, and your humidity is around 80%, and you've got a 2,000-foot runway to take off from, you'll never get off the ground. And if you know weather, you'll know that. That you'll never get off the ground in 95 degree weather and 80% humidity. Your airplane will not come off the ground in 200 feet. Now if, you're, if your air temperature is back up to around 60 and the, the, the um, uh, humidity is low, you'll get off of that 2,000 feet in a heartbeat. And I had the hardest time in that transition because here I was at that time 40 years old and I'm having to learn how to go to school again. I'm learning to have to learn how how to dig again and how to study again and how to how to make changes and being out of school at that point for 20 years or so being out of school now I'm having to make a transition and go back to school and I've got to teach this old dog some new tricks. Thank God you're not a dog, right? Can't teach an old dog new tricks where you're not a you're not a dog. All right. So I learned how to fly, and then all of a sudden, things start opening up for me. By 1996, Cheryl and I were flying into the Bahamas and the Caribbeans in an airplane ourselves that I was piloting and doing mission work in the islands. Every summer, I chartered a jet and took 30 people to the islands did revival all week long every night and vacation Bible school in five different churches with a hundred kids in each church every, every time we met during the day. So we, had, we put five people at each church, hundred kids at each church, 
I'm telling you, we had an exciting vacation Bible school. We had fights every day. Because these were street kids. These were not church kids. Fights broke out all the time. But I had people, I didn't have these Mamby Pamby Christians in there. Mamby Pamby Christians go back home, you can't handle the fighting part. And they were able to handle that. And so all of a sudden, then we fly over to the Abaco Islands and to a little place called Cherokee Sound. And revival breaks out. All transitioning. Transitioning's happening. Transition's happening. Transition's happening. All, again, I thought God was going to move us over there. I had a man gave me five acres of land on the island of Eleuthera. And when, it, when God showed me that he, we were not going to move over there, I gave it back to him. And, uh, but it, there was such a powerful revival taking place. I felt like God was going to take it, leave us there. However, in the year 2000, for the first time since I'd been going over there, persecution broke out against me. All because a church gave me $1,000. Well, it was costing me like seven to $800 to fly over there every time and to get food and rent an airplane and that sort of thing. And, uh, and so I wasn't you know maybe three hundred dollars was all i was making and but persecution broke out and many churches in this island started coming against me turned me into the bahamas customs and so all of a sudden instead of standing my ground and saying i'm not leaving god's called me here i said lord what are you trying to do is my time here done and I felt like my time was done, and I never will forget flying back into Fort Pierce where we cleared customs. Flowed into Fort Pierce, my feet touched the ground. And this is where God shifted me to where I fell in love with Florida. I laid down on the tarmac, and I kissed the tarmac in the state of Florida. And a shift occurred on the inside of me. But all of that required pain. To bring me to that place where the shift could occur. I hope you're getting this. This is some good stuff. All right. Anytime you have transition, there's always going to be conflict. Let me say this again. Anytime you have transition, there's always going to be conflict. And don't be punching your husband, okay? Or your spouse or somebody next to you. Teresa, don't be saying anything to Hal, okay? <laughs> Anytime there's transition, there's always conflict, and there's always a cost. Transition does not come without a cost. It's going to cost you, and, and it's okay if it happened to somebody else, but what about me? It's going to happen to you too, because change is coming. Even David goes through a change. David goes out on the battlefield. He kills a giant. Everybody's singing the praises of David. Saul doesn't let him go back home. Saul brings him into his palace, starts rewarding him, gives him lands, gives him uh, uh, houses. He doesn't have to pay taxes and gives him his daughter. Didn't work out too well, but he did. And then all of a sudden, persecution breaks out in the house of Saul against David. Now, that had to happen for David to be moved to where he could become king later on. He had to experience pain so that he could learn how to be a king and be a king in humility. Let me say that again. He had to experience pain. There were many different times that he experienced pain. He came home from Ziglag one time and found and his men with him. And their whole city had been burned. Their, their families taken. And the Bible says that they all begin crying, but David began crying more than all of them because everybody has talked about stoning him. And then all of a sudden a shift occurs. See, David's getting this thing now. He's learning how to deal with this transition, how to deal with the pain. A shift occurs, and the Bible says he encourages himself in the Lord. I love this. He doesn't just stay in the pain. Say He doesn't stay in the pain. He doesn't stay in the pain. A shift occurs in David, and that shift needed to occur. Otherwise, he could not go and get the victory. And let me say this again. 
The shift in David had to occur, otherwise he couldn't go and get the victory and bring their families back home. We get bogged down in trauma. We get bogged down in the middle of change and don't allow change to take its full course or don't allow ourselves to, 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 to allow that to walk out or encourage ourselves in the Lord. And we sit down and what the enemy stolen for us from us, we let him have it. That's what we do. We, we just give it to him. Here, devil, you can have this. I'm just too tired. Now, about half of David's men were too tired to go. But he took the ones who were able, went and defeated the Amalekites, I think it was, began bringing back all the spoils. And when he gets back with all the spoils, the guys who went with him said, these guys who didn't go, they can't have this. David said, because he's learned how to transition. He's learned humility. He said, that belongs to them. And we're going to give them their due also, what belongs to them. I love this about David. He learned how to transition. David goes through change. There's also a story, if you look with me in Luke chapter 8. This is 22 through 25. Now, it came about on one of those days, say one of those days. Yeah, it was one of those days that he and his disciples got into a boat. And he said to them, let's go over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep, talking about Jesus. And a fierce gale of wind descended upon the lake. And they began to be swamped and to be in danger. And they came to him and woke him up saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. And being aroused, he rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped and it became calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? Now I want you to, I want to look, let's look together at the processes of change. First of all, they had a word from the Lord. It was one of those days when the word of the Lord came forth. Let me say this again. It's one of those days when the word of the Lord came forth. They had a word from the Lord to get in the boat and go to the other side. As they, as they launch out, say so they launch out. See, launching is the easy part. When you start building an apostolic center like we're doing here, the easy part is getting the word. The easy part is launching. It's getting to the other side where we're looking and walking and talking and acting like an apostolic center instead of a local church that's going to be the challenge for every one of us here. Because it's totally different. You can get a word and you can launch, but making yourself go to that other side is a whole different story. So they launch out, they start sailing, everything's going good. We're going to the other side. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go to the other side. God, you've got this. We're going to the other side. As they're going, as they have this word, as they have launched, as they are sailing, all of a sudden, some kind of thing comes up to try to stop them. Ian, you ever had a, been in a bad storm in the ocean? I'm talking about Ian back here. They sail. <clears throat> so they're sailing along. Jesus has fallen asleep. A storm comes up. Something they're going to have to deal with. And as they're thinking about how to deal with it, they're thinking, we're in danger. And they go to the, Jesus and they said, listen, Jesus, we're perishing. We're not going to become this apostolic center. We're perishing. We're not going to be able to get to the other side. I don't care what you said in the beginning. Hello. I don't care if we have launched. We're not getting there because this is too tough. It requires pain. I've heard the word, but pain is involved. I've heard the word, but I have a fear of dying. I have a fear of losing my identity. I have a fear of not making it all the way to the other side. Woo! Jesus gets up and he 
says to the wind, to the waves, stop it. Just stop it. He rebukes the wind and the wave. <laughs> I've got to show this clip to you guys sometime. He rebukes the wind and the wave and it ceases. And the disciples are amazed. However, Jesus had a word of rebuke for them. Where's your faith? Where's your faith? Jesus, the ship was filling up with water. Yeah, but I said. Jesus, we were about to be capsized. Yeah, but I said. Jesus, I think I'm going to lose my life. Yeah, but I said. You have to remember that. It's easy to get the word. It's easy to launch. But going to the other side is a whole different story. Because there's going to be a wind that comes against you personally, against me, against corporately. A wind that says, hey, you know what? Let's just go back to the way we were. Let's go back to land. Let's turn this boat around. And in a storm, turning a boat around is one of the worst things you can ever do. Especially when you try to put that thing against the waves. I've never been in waves like Ian has, I'm sure. But I, I, Cheryl and I grew up on two major arteries of river in Alabama. The Black Warrior River and the Tom Bigby River. And I've been out in the middle of that thing where I, my little boat I was in, I would fall down in a, in, a, in a swell and I couldn't see nothing on the other, I couldn't see over each side of the, of the waves. It was so treacherous and I'm thinking, and, and see I'm already out in the middle of it. I can't turn this boat around. If I turn this semi V aluminum boat around, I'm going to swamp it because the waves are going to come on top of it. So I have to go, I have to grip my teeth, and guess what I do? I go to the other side. Everything within me is telling me you're going to die, but I knew if I kept my senses about me, I could get to the other side. Then when it's time, I went over there and I ran my trot lines. I had to go back. It didn't change. So I just, I kept going up the river and up the river. Maybe I can, and listen, I'm, where I was crossing this river, I'm only a quarter of a mile from about a 30-foot drop dam. And I'm thinking to myself, i got to get up way up this river so if anything happens, I'll be able to get to land somehow. I go way up the river, and the, the waves didn't change. And so I start coming back across, kept my wits about me, started coming back across to the other side so I could get to where, God, where I needed to be. Actually, I wasn't a Christian at the time, but I think God probably spared me that day. Where's your faith? There comes a moment, and Chuck Pierce said this, there comes a moment when what has resisted you will fall if you will stay the course. There comes a time with what, that what has resisted you will fall. And this is my part here, if you stay the course. The Lord gives us options, and I'm going to start bringing this to one of my many closings. He gives us many options. The old is getting bulldozed up. That's just all there is to it. God told Joshua, he said, listen, Moses, my servant, is dead. Joshua knew that, but he was telling him, one administration now is over. I'm bringing you into a new, a new administration called the Joshua administration. You can't grieve him anymore. He's with me. I need you to take this people into Canaan land. See, they've been through 40 years of wilderness, 40 years of change. 40 years because they didn't want to change. And we can either turn back or we can possess our inheritance. You can turn back or you can possess your inheritance. You can embrace change, you can embrace pain, you can embrace the commitment, and you'll get to the other side and there'll be great gain. I'm going to read you one more verse of Scripture and then I'm going to begin one of my second closings. Luke chapter 9. And I'm going to read this out of the Passion Translation. Verse 62. This is the translation where you hear Jesus talking about putting the hand to the plow. Now I've I've done a little bit of gardening. Cheryl and I used to have a garden. Um, about the quarter of this 
size of this room, not half size, but quarter of the size. And whenever I would get that, I always had a tractor come in and till this thing up really well. And then I would bring my garden tiller out there and I would till it up really well. We had what was called sandy loam soil. But when I would get ready to make the rows, I would run a string with two sticks down on the other side so that I could make a straight row. Say straight row. <coughs> and I would take my hoe and I would make that straight row down through there and I would go and do that again, making sure each time is same evenly spaced apart. Now hear what Jesus said here whenever he talked about putting your hand to the plow. <coughs> Jesus responded, why do you keep looking backward? This is the Passion Translation. Why do you keep looking backward? Boy, that ought to hit some of us. Why do you keep looking backward to your past and have second thoughts about following me? Hello. This is good. Why do you have second thoughts about what God has initiated in your life? In Florida here why are you having second thoughts about it listen to what he says now when you turn back when you look back when you turn back you are useless to God's kingdom realm it doesn't mean you're not saved you just can't be used because of the fact you're looking back at what was you're looking back at what has been instead of looking to what the Lord has said. The Bible says in Isaiah 46 10. God said there. He says I decree the end from the beginning. Amen. He makes a declaration. This is, what, this is where you're going. And when you look at that word. I decree the end from the beginning. That word end there is akarith. And it's, it actually means. It's like it's a Hebrew way of thinking. A man rows a boat. And when you row a boat. Guess what you do. You back into where you're going. It says a man rowing a boat, he backs into his future. In other words, you can't, if you're rowing a boat, you can't turn around like this to try to look where you're going. Because if you do, you're going to wind up going in circles. You launch from that marker that you just left from, and you keep your eye focused on that marker. You keep your eye focused on that prophetic word, and you just keep rowing, and you keep rowing, and you keep rowing. I still see that word. I'm going to keep rowing. I still hear that word, I'm going to keep rowing. I still believe that word, I'm going to keep rowing. And you just keep rowing, and you keep rowing, and then at some point, you reach the other side. When we were at Tim Sheets, and Dutch and I and his son-in-law went fishing up in Tennessee in April, we had one of those days where it was really rough. And the thing was, we had gone out early when it wasn't rough. And Tim and I were in a boat together. And it's time to go home. But it had those same swells I was telling you about. But we were determined to get to the other side. And we kept our wits about us. And we made it all the way over to the other side. Stand to your feet if you would.